Welcome to Vista Talks, interesting discussions with interesting people from all around the world. I am your host for today, Maria Roa, and I am delighted to be joined by Patricia Matsimovic. Patricia has over three decades of experience in successful partnerships built around compassionate, empathy-driven business relationship. She was awarded Quality of the Year for Management and Innovative Training and gained numerous industry accreditations. Patricia is currently the founder at Open Solutions Global at the London Business Academy. She's also chapter director at the Startup Grind, supporting the tech ecosystems in the north of England. Her favorite projects to work on involve helping technology organizations and entrepreneurs grow. Patricia, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's our pleasure to have you here. Let's move on because I have many things that I would <laughs> like to ask you today. First of all, I've heard that you had an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial soul since very early. Is it true that you started your business when you were 17? Tell us a little bit more about it. Did you always want it to be an entrepreneur? Was it uh, something that you had in your mind? Yes. Um, yes, that's the official, uh, official sort of, you know, um, way, I say, 17. Uh, I think a bit earlier, quite frankly, because I've always, oh I w I've always been that kind of a kid that was, uh, you know, trying to do things their way and trying to find ways to do something different. My first word, I think that I that I used and overused for a very long time, and my mom always keeps saying, was uh, I do it myself. So, and in Polish, it mm. just sounds sama meaning leave me alone, I'm, I'm on it. So uh, from very early on, I, I, I had that very entrepreneurial kind of spirit, figuring out what I can do, how to, how to monetize it even when I was a kid. So I remember, I think the first time where I really made my first money was at the age of either nine or 11, I'm not really sure. Uh, we were doing a project, uh, art project at school, and I decided I'm going to monetize it. Everyone was just wowed by that. They were like Makrama things. Um, and I took that to the local market, 6 a.m. Tuesday, Thursday, and I was going to the market and selling those Makramas. Then I hired one of the school um you know friends to because she was also good at it and i said like, well camilla you're coming with me and we're going to sell it we were selling there so that was my first unofficial but yes at 17 i uh set up a language school by by total accident i was always very passionate about helping people and very passionate about if if i learned something if i was doing something and i loved it i wanted to share so at some stage i started teaching some of my some of my you know friends and friends of family you know young young students i was at a good school i i was going to england quite often it was early 90s and in poland the language industry was not so that well developed there were language teachers they often never been to england never spoke fluent fluent english uh, so somehow by me sharing not just the language, but but more importantly, I think that the passion for the culture and the experience, everyone was wild and they started bringing more and more. So within, I think, three weeks, I had um, I, I basically had a boutique school with people coming and very quickly I started having professionals coming dropping from the classes in the local language school coming to me i had very good examples at my own school where i was still a student secondary school i was in a, a public school which is uh, like a private um we we really had a very good curriculum so i was basically i think observing my very very good teacher one of the best in the region and and looking like what she's doing how she's doing that and replicating that, adding that layer of, you know, culture passion. So that very quickly kind of spanned out into uh, when I when I went to university, I didn't stuck with that. I was I was actually very quickly on my first year providing classes for 
uh, you know, uh, more, more students. And I think on the second year, I started doing also, you know, delivery on a corporate site, hiring teachers to work for me because we, we kept getting a lot of clients. So I started working on curricula, etc. Very early on, I don't think that would be possible nowadays, but late, um, you know, uh, look, looking back, early 90s in, in Poland, then coming kind of like at late, the whole sort of 90s, because that, that was, I think, 98 when we started delivering uh, corporate training for, for bigger companies and uh, for the Polish Navy. So that was at the time I already had the BA degree, actually, mm -hmm. in language teaching. Um, it, it turned into one of the biggest providers in the region uh, of the North Poland sort of covering, yes, the uh, Air Force, Navy officers, Police Academy, and, and a lot of corporate clients as well. And very quickly spawned into uh, helping businesses with their internal and external communications. So that was the very, very beginning where, where I set up something. And from then on, I, I, I've always had that, like you said, that entrepreneurial soul. So it was my only business. At the same time with the then partner, we, we also had the real estate agencies. We had uh, sailing school. So I think over the last 30 years, I've, I've put my fingers in so many different pies in different sectors that it kind of like gives you the the quite interesting portfolio of like projects all over the place because they were you know all all very different but I think that education sort of industry training and and that business communication was the beginning and I'm always on that journey uh, to some extent present in majority of the projects that I that I've been doing. My God, Patricia. So you basically <laughs> started the language industry in Poland somehow. I mean, um, not even knowing that you were doing that. I, I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I started that, but I, I, I did definitely. I In my local town, I changed the perception of what language yeah. teaching should be. And actually later on, um, and it was uh, when I already did the companies was, was quite big. Um, I, 2001, I gave birth to my daughter. And that's also a very good example of me doing things like I do it on my own. So again, going back to that myself, I, I do it myself. Um, there was, so I gave birth, before I gave birth to my daughter, I knew that, well, I'm pregnant, I'm going to have a baby. I want my baby to be bilingual. And um, there were no bilingual nurseries or, you know, for, Mm. And, and anything for children I mean no one thought that well you can have one year old and try to work on it to be bilingual but I knew that my home is going to be in the UK I'm currently in Poland and I want my child to be exposed to English language from the beginning um, so I set up a nursery for children from the age of uh, 0.5 so half a year old could come for a number of hours with the uh, um, native speakers and spend time playing. Basically, I developed the cur curriculum, which was also my master thesis at another, you know, doing, doing another diploma. So I set up a nursery and that nursery um, kind of um, spanned into, um, you know, I could say that I pioneered and, and uh, broke grounds for the bilingual teaching in the north of Poland because there was nothing and very quickly the public nurseries uh, approached me and said like well we would like to incorporate that into our curriculum maybe review the way we teach English in in our nurseries if you could you know uh, train our teachers and maybe review the curricula and see what we could do so I intro then then I introduced works working with one of the public nurseries uh, in the north of Poland, we we started introducing the kind of a bilingual approach uh, with the native speakers working with children. So yes, well, in a way, I've always been. I never liked easy projects. I always liked uh, the challenge and something that is, you know, like no one's doing this, so I'm gonna do it, and I'm going to prove that it makes sense. Um, it's never easy. <laughs> You are completely amazing. I have no words. And everything you've been doing, it's uh, it's working for 
let's say that the good of language I mean which for me it's really important being a person who works on another language I mean wor works with another language I speak four languages and I have lived in five different countries and I feel it is really important uh, for people to understand that speaking a different language is something that gives us so much other than just knowledge absolutely absolutely so thank you for that and the biggest really <laughs> having a baby a baby learning a different language i think it will open them to a new world a new culture and so many more things that i mean i'm so thankful for my parents for giving me this opportunity that i think these type of things yeah. that you did are just like the right things so but let's keep because we could be talking about this for hours and they're gonna kill me uh <laughs> anyways uh you've been talking about how do you create a strategy plans for businesses communication plans um could you tell us how that works uh what is important for you to know about a company in order to be able to help them yes yeah, so nowadays, yes, yeah, so I'm far from the language industry uh, for the last yeah. decade, or actually even more, it's, it's been very much helping others grow. And so uh, I think for at, at the very beginning, uh, the, the things that I'd be looking for, you know, in, in companies to help, they would be different and they've changed over time. So over the time and, you know, the, the number of projects you do, you learn a lot, like what not to touch, what to touch, where is the potential, who I'm going to work with. So right now I'd say I've became very selective. Firing clients is uh, no longer a problem for me. I've <laughs> done it. Uh, I think sometimes it's better to say goodbye. So number one, before I even see and identify the problems that they have and whether we are in a position to help them, number one is first thing, is that really, uh, you know, a business that does something that appeals to me? Mm -hmm. uh, am I buying into it? And even if they have a problem communicating what they do, because very often when a business expands into UK, you know, you kind of, or if it's a new tech business and you've got five PhD researchers working on that deep tech, they, they're not always able to articulate what, what really they are bringing to the table. And sometimes they are amazing things. But, you know, once you kind of like look at this, you're very quickly able to say like, well, I'm, am I buying into it? Do I like the people that represent that business? Can I imagine myself working with them? Because usually those projects take quite a lot of time. I mean, we had clients uh, once, uh, I think, 36 months working on a project. Sometimes it's six months, but even those six months can be a pain if you choose a wrong client. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's always, uh, it's like dating. It has to be both ways. So the client needs to buy into us, but I'm also kind of, uh, interviewing the client or, or you know, you, you, you have the dating heroes when you figure out, like, do I really want to work with them, help them? Do I believe in what they're bringing? Is it something that will, you know, is it the tech for good? Is it impactful solution? And uh, yeah, do, 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 do I want to represent them? Because very often we, we are a consultancy, but very often a lot of clients say like, all right, well, can you help us with the execution? So number one is, do they appeal to me? Do I want to work with those people and with that business? And that the second thing is uh, basically where they are. Uh, are they ready to, to go to that next stage and trying to, during the discovery stage, which I call a discovery workshop, sometimes that workshop takes a week, sometimes it takes half a day, well, it depends on where they are, um, you know, on, on the growth stage, it's ready to establish uh, what elements are missing and are we really able to help them so these i i, I would say these are the, the two things the third thing and in the past i was not so careful about that and i've learned that um it's really important is uh and and i bring it right now at the very early conversation sometimes actually on the first call even when i before i deep dive into okay, what are the problems is uh, their budgets and uh, do they do they actually have the funds and how 
far can the response take take us in you know because very often um i'm approached by companies from abroad saying like we've got amazing tech uh we we are ready to launch and we like to go into the uk or into the us and you think like, all right well what's your budget oh no 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 we just like you know maybe some low-hanging fruit and we can I just never like that you you need to be ready to invest it's always say like so trying to make the client understand that this is an investment this is not mm -hmm. something that will help to you know save your sales that might be dropping in your own country and you think like i'll come to the uk and i'll just kind of like you know it will even out it never even up evens out it takes a long time so you know yeah th those three things like are they in a position to invest not even to pay my fees but to invest because my, my fees is one thing but but you know uh, growth is an investment always um are they uh, are they appealing and uh and yeah and then we look into a uh, right so how much it's gonna be and how much work and, and the timeline so i think those those three things would be the most important to me right now in the past i my, my first questions would be like all oh, right well what, what do we need to do and then i was like we're actually up to that project but i'm, I'm not really feeling it so hmm. Uh, yeah, sometimes it's better to to sit with no client for a month uh, rather than to sit with a client who is a time vampire, who is, uh, you know, in, in so many ways. So, yes, being, being, being more selective, I think that's something that we learned. Um, and, and, and these are the lessons that you guys <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess this is also you also have to teach uh, your clients in a way um, who to say yes and who to I mean how to say no, which is the hardest part for a business. But sometimes you need to say no. Uh, so basically, you say first I need to decide if I want to work with that company. Then if I didn't note this wrong, uh, are they ready to take on this project and do they have the budget to, to do it? If they do, then you develop and execute a new strategy plan for them. You also help them with communications strategies, uh, anything to net generate new ways to enhance uh, their efficiency uh, in every possible way. Is there any common mistake that you have seen companies doing over and over again. Something that you say, oh my God, I can't believe this, <laughs> all the companies doing this again. I mean, if so, could you please uh, let, our, let our audience know and tell yeah. us how they can fix it? Yeah, well, where, where do I start? There absolutely a lot <laughs> of them. And so I think sometimes when, when you see a client coming from this way or a client coming from that way, you can almost put a bet on it that it's going to bring that that you know that, that that's going to happen there is probably that mistake slipping there i think coming back to the previous question you know when when you're identifying who you want to work with and why you have to be very careful whether you engage with them or not it's not just appealing but also whether they're ready if you take someone on the journey with you assuming or based your assumption on they told you they're ready because mm -hmm. they're great in their, their own market or they believe they're ready they're a startup here in the uk they believe they're ready just help us and you and i did that mistake once you start throwing bigger bones towards them without really sitting down and reviewing uh and that brings us to that question you know communication strategies i think they're Communication is, 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 we could say in a way, a core business, both internal and external, because a lot depends on it. So that's, that kind of links with all the systems and, and everything that they have in place. If you don't review that in, in terms of, you know, how they deal with the sales process, how they treat their customers, how they communicate with organization, not just how they communicate what they do to the potential clients, then you get a very good understanding and a picture whether they are going to uh, choke on the project that you're throwing towards them uh, once the strategy is executed. 
and and we are I don't know getting getting new leads from from that you know certain certain group that you targeted or whether they're going to actually swallow them and ask for more so yes in the past we we, we I mean I, I had uh, with my team uh, a client clients where we have not done that homework I think to the degree that it should be and started throwing bigger bones towards towards an organization that was actually not able to not able to deal with them so when when I work and I think I'm kind of um, um, maybe you know in a way an unusual combination because the, the, the community on, when, when I worked with and, and, and I work with the communicate uh, on communication with companies. It's both the internal and the external. So when we look at the strategy, first of all, uh, yes, how you communicate, what they what, what they do, how they communicate, how how they engage with the uh, with the stakeholders and potential potential target audience. But first of all, I think that 360 degree during the discovery stage can very easily show uh, what they have in, in place internally within the organization and how does that work. So the biggest mistakes, I think, very often looking internally uh, is when the company grows, uh, you, need to, you need to make sure that those systems in place are ready for growth. And very often, what I see, both working with small organizations or with bigger ones, and I've worked on an external, uh, internal comps with actually some some of the very big clients, like uh, let's say Scania, for example, where we were looking at, uh, you know, how they at, at the process and the way they communicate between two different production companies, kind of the, the, the HQ, but also looking at the different, uh, you know, levels within the organizations and different departments, engineers, um, mm -hmm. then the, you know, the, um, so, so all, all the design teams, then the production, and then looking at how um, we were working on double-decker buses, actually, that uh, later on uh, were riding in, in London. Also, all the communication on the buses. So kind of like looking at all different aspects and, and you know, that, that's the example of the bigger company, but looking at both, both big ones and, and um, the small ones, I think very quickly, very often when they grow, um, if they are not careful, it's very easy to lose the, lose the, I'm, I'm not really sure how to, how to describe it, but lose the, the your, your uh, focus on your vision and what you're actually doing. So, so to give you an example, Maria, um, sometimes during that discovery stage, when you engage with the client and you bring the whole team, you don't always only speak to, to the top boss or the top mm -hmm. team, but you want to really uh, go and see the dynamics within the team, how they're working, are the departments talking to each other? Um, do they really understand both marketing and sales? Do they are doing the same or the, you know, what the product is? Sometimes, yeah. you know, and you, you go and you, you do that homework and you very quickly, very often point out that um, there are 15 people you spoke to and everyone gave you different answer to the same question where you should expect the same question, uh, the same answer um, when you're asking like, all right, well, so, so what's the, what's the mission or what, how, how do you communicate to your clients, you know, what you're doing? Uh, very often that, that kind of goes blurred and as the company grows very often that kind of gets washed away so i think having those processes internally in place and making sure that the teams are speaking that the messaging and that's what you really want your you know uh outside you know stakeholders to and, and, and clients to to you know get that image of of what you're doing um, is really well understood within the company. So the 
so so all that is is very important sometimes it means you know that you need systems to support it like technology to, to support that communication or the you know project management tools your end tools so on on a tech site you need to have that but also uh be, be be sure that everyone every single person from you know from that level to that level really has a very good understanding of why and and what they're doing and what value they're bringing and then translating that into because that will translate into into external comps dealing with the clients if they don't have that really good understanding then dealing with the clients and communicating to the clients might actually be impacted so really you know very very often um working with uh especially with tech companies you um you ask them on a very first or you look at the website and then you have a conversation and they're ex super excited and using the tech lingo they're trying to expect uh, 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 you know explain that uh, what that computational modeling or the ai is doing and how cool is this and you sit there and you listen for 10 minutes then you speak to another person and you feel like what what what, what is it what are, what are you actually delivering so i think this is usually the biggest mistake with the tech companies uh not really looking at what you're doing in the eyes with the eyes of that you know um user or or potential buyer sometimes users and buyers may be different but really mm -hmm. thinking about who is going to engage what, what not even what we are doing but yes what what we deliver in in terms of the value um and then yes companies that that very often if they begin they're expanding into the uk or into the us really try to make sure that um uh, yeah that that's um that way they're communicating is is right for the market that you know you, you take all the cultural aspects sometimes uh certain things have to be different so all that needs to be taken into account and i think very often yes if if the client is from abroad i usually i i, I don't like to assume but very often in 90 percent of the cases it's like well they want to do it the way they do it in their country we had uh once the client who you know was was um providing um they, they they were basically trying to sell the financial education tools in, in the uk and um the way they were talking about it the way they were engaged they were engaging with potential clients here was very much exactly a translation of what they were doing in the domestic market which worked and it has not worked here for them for like five years coming to uh you know business shows investing a lot of money and spending basically wasting that money coming back and again and and you know trying to do something where uh we engage with them very quickly i i figure out the like oh I will, but you have to really tweak a number of things to change that and to see whether whether you know it's it's going to bring that change and, and maybe a bigger impact and yes so so very often that's that and then very often when you're dealing even with the uk-based companies and, and working on tech um you really need to you really need to make sure that uh, they're not talking about the solution uh you know in terms of what we do but um but um really understanding that that stakeholder we have to change that messaging into in, into something slightly different yeah Talk, yeah. thinking about the end result would be deliver rather than what yeah we... you've been talking a lot about um tech companies and i mentioned in your presentation that your favorite projects to work on involve helping technology organizations and entrepreneurs grow why technology i mean there are so many people who are like not <laughs> technology i might say i'm one of them I, maybe because i don't know it too well and i'm kind of scared of it so so why technology uh, it's it's not an easy question to answer really i think i always had that technology was always kind of a sweet spot for me i i really? loved uh, i think i 
I like the way that it can impact the business. And even coming back to, to, you know, to doing the 360 degree and looking into companies and like, oh, we're struggling. We cannot go from here to there. And very often I, I, I realize very often this is because of tech, because this is because of the lack, tech, lack of tech that they're not using. So I think I've realized over the years that tech is sexy and can change the business you know, in, in such a positive and a powerful way, if you know what you need to implement and how you can implement it. So I think it's a huge growth enabler for the business. And oh, I do, I do agree with that. I do have to agree that technology yeah. is good for everything and it's helping so much to grow in so many ways. I mean, so many ways. It's just that I, I feel like I'm so clumsy with everything <laughs> to technology and that everything, every time something new comes out, I feel like I need to study hard as if I was back at uni or something in order to understand everything that I just feel like you feeling so comfortable in that environment. Uh, it, it, I, that's why I was my question is like, why did you choose technology? I feel it was like, it would be like the last industry I would choose. I I think, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't have a tech background, but I like it. I spend hours on it. I mean, I really do enjoy uh, mapping a system for the clients to make sure that this will improve your comms with the clients, with the team, da, da, da. So it's, it's really, I think, enjoy it, it. You know, I enjoy that because once you implement it, once you explain to everyone, like, look, what it's gonna, it's, it's going to change your business, you know, in a in a huge way. Um, you can very quickly see the results. You can very quickly provide it that they really, you know, learn and understand how and and why they need to use it. Because sometimes you implement a system somewhere, and you you, you know, people use it for a first week when someone's watching and then you walk away and and not but i think you know technology is everywhere and also like when you go if you go on on on, on my website you'll see yes we work with tech businesses but quite frankly majority of businesses are tech businesses nowadays whether it's e-commerce you're in retail but but you're also in e-commerce so i think you can't ex ex escape that tech it's everywhere and uh, it's a huge enabler and and i think what i what i like is that it enables business progress if it's not whether it's a tech business or not you 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 can implement it it can help you to to make that progress but also what i really love and the companies that i always look for to to work with and to engage with are the ones that you know that that tech you know, we, we talk a lot about tech for good and, you know, life-changing tech. This is this is something that is, I consider the sexiest, uh, sexier, uh, where where you can you can see the power of technology changing lives for people and, and, and bringing that change, that, that positive impact. So I think, uh, yes, you know, within the companies what it can do, but basically when, when you've got a tech company that introduces something that is absolutely life-changing for, for people in this or that way, uh, then then yes, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, that it's a pleasure to work with on that business because then once you've completed a project, you're very proud yes. uh, that, I helped them in some way to clean the air pollution or I helped I them to uh, improve experience of, you know, engaging in museums. I think mm -hmm. without introducing tech in the right way, uh, we would be back in the past. And, you know, you, you can't ignore it. Well, we are coming to the end of the show. So <laughs> But before we go, I would like to ask you one last thing. How did you start being involved in the Startup Grind? Uh, tell us about the project. What do you do there? Yes. So um, I think a fundamental tenet of my business was always connecting people, connecting ideas to opportunities, connecting businesses with businesses, whether it was open solutions and then, you know, the, the academy was about that. And then, 
um, just after lockdown, so I moved to the north of England, I left London, um, and the, well, uh, the, you know, the, the, the business environment here is slightly different than, of course, not being in London. Um, so I've known Startup Grind from my time in London, and I knew how powerful the organization is, because it's, you know, basically, um, global organization with millions of members and and million well not millions but hundreds of chapters 600 chapters are uh, enabling growth of tech within the ecosystem that they've built so when i moved to the north of england everyone knows that it the, you know south of the north we, we keep talking about uh, the sort of well i wouldn't say a divide but there there is a you know a, a slight difference in if if you are in the ecosystem um and i thought like wait why not uh try to bring something that will impact that ecosystem maybe open one more door or build one more door in the ecosystem for the companies to to you know to to have more opportunities but, Basically, what Start Grind does, or what what I, as a director in the north, uh, do, because I'm I'm a chapter director here, uh, in the northeast and and north, so it's Yorkshire and the northeast, is helping the enterprise on their journey by providing the you know uh, educational opportunities, providing great speakers, providing that expertise and knowledge that might be missing or that might not be available in, within the ecosystem, giving the spotlight to anything that is actually happening within the ecosystem on a more kind of a global scale. And I think the biggest, um, the biggest, uh, you know, opportunity that it um, help, brings to the ecosystem is, is that very close connection with, first of all, our global chapters and an ecosystem of well-connected chapters so if you're expanding your business into china or you want to expand i don't know to france it's much easier because we've got that very very good connections but most importantly that's uh, silicon valley and and that's connecting with the both investment and opportunities and it's like I say, I mean, you know, every ecosystem has a lot of different stakeholders and, and they do great things. So it's, it's, it's just opening another door of opportunities for them. And yeah, so, so that's, that's my role in Startup Grinds. It's obviously very nicely aligns with what I do with, with my own, own business, um, but in a, in a way, um, Kind of coming back to 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 uh, you know the very first question when you asked me why you know uh, about my entrepreneurial journey I started there were there was not much support for me when I started in the nineties and I think right now it's it's in a way it's sort of paying forward or giving back and 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 helping others because our uh, that that entrepreneurial journey is uh, is extremely is always very um, you know exciting, but it can be extremely challenging and, and very lonely. And we always say like, oh, it's lonely on the top. It's lonely when you when you have your own business. So it's it's in a way it's kind of like accompanying those those chapter members to to show them like, well, you can learn one from another, connecting them one to another, and yeah. So Patricia, if anyone uh, anyone from our audience is listening and would like to know more about a Startup Grind, is there a website or anywhere that where they can look at? Yes, startupgrind, or one word, dot com. So that's the main website for Startup Grind. If they'd like to connect, uh, membership is free. They have to be qualified. So they have to apply for the membership. We have um, every year, huge event in Silicon Valley, San Francisco in April. This year is going to be 12th and 13th of April, where we also as directors uh, try to select the biggest and the most promising scale-ups from each region and, and take them as a delegation to escape to pitch the investors there and take part in the global conference, which is, so as I, I would say, it's one of the biggest events for the for enterprise in tech, uh, flying from all you know places globally to Silicon Valley, and uh, 
great sessions with amazing speakers. So yes, they, they can find it all on the website. Obviously, then they can look at chapters near near them. They might not be my chapters, but there might be someone sitting in Warsaw or Moscow or, or Kiev listening right now. And uh, we've, we've got chapters in most of the cities because it is across the globe. Uh, so that's that's how they can find out more. So that was the last question, Patricia. Thank you so much for being our guest today. That's the end of today's show with Patricia Matsimovic. Please make sure to tune in again uh, to see or to listen to the next Vista Talks episode where we will be discussing more interesting topics with interesting people from all around the world. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Maria.